all funds for fiscal year 2021 was um, 33.381 million. So minus um, a two point, um, that 1.6 million goes down to, um, uh, 30, about 31, 31 something. <laughs> Sorry. 31 million for this coming seven. year. 31 seven. Thank you. For the, and then for the, current, for the okay. current fiscal year and then, okay. um, total pay act for, um, year two, I don't think changes. Um, that would be 36 million. That's 36. all. 36. 36 yeah. million for the second that, year. Yeah, is that um, actually if Harold Schwartz is on, is that correct if um, pay act is, does the pay act for fiscal year 21 impact fiscal year 22? I don't think it does. Harold, go ahead and unmute yourself. We would love if you have those numbers in front of you. The, uh, yeah, for the exempts that would affect the second year uh, uh, because of the step piece. So we have to go calculate that. But the numbers you were talking about also were all funds, not GF. So um, I just want to make that clear. I mean, w w however people want to get the numbers, we, we may need to go back and come back to you guys later with the, with the splits, depending on what you want. Um, it's kind of hard to do it on the fly. Jim, how do you want your information? <laughs> no, I, I think at some point it would be good to have a breakdown. I think, um, you know, obviously we have to look at the total amount and, and work with appropriations as to, um, we can pass anything we want, but appropriations has to find a way to fund it. So um, I, I, I think that might be a, a conversation with them and, and how they break it on to the various funds, whether it's education or whether it's general fund or transportation fund, whatever. Um, we, we don't, uh, well, we don't have anything here then on judiciary as part of this. Is that, is that correct, Beth? I have, um, I can share with you kind of our estimates for judiciary, um, how, how we've, how we've broken it out, but we would definitely want, um, the judiciary to, um, confirm those numbers because we haven't really We have the judiciary those. on the call and we'll hear from them in a few minutes. Okay. Any other Sounds questions? Good. Yeah. One more, um, Beth, the, the skinny budget for the first three months, uh, supposedly has, uh, you built in an 8% reduction, um, uh, pretty much across the board from what I understand. Um, does that um, include any um, staff reductions uh, anticipated to get at that 8% reduction? I think that's kind of, that's a question for each department on how they are going to try to get to that 8% um, uh, reduction. Uh, for us, um, for Department of Human Resources, I mean, we definitely have uh, money. We're working, doing a lot of work to support the um, uh, coronavirus relief. So we do have some fund that will be there that will help us for that budget. But it was really presented to us is that it's, this is our funding to continue running our government. And we haven't done um, the full look to see what... Um, to see what our full fiscal year will look like for 21. So uh, there may be some departments may have some staff reductions in there. I'm not aware that there are any in there to make their actual uh, first quarter budgets. I don't have any, I do have um, vacancy savings in there. We do have a hiring freeze. Um, so there are the vacancy savings that are in there that are included that are going to help us get through that first section. Um, and, uh, and so th that's really where we are right now as far as, um, as far as um, personnel, um, personnel um, kind of constraints for people okay. to, for people to kind of close out fiscal year 20 and to kind of get through the beginning of fiscal year 21 until we really know what we're going to be budgeting for the full year. Thank you.
Thank you. John Gannon Chair. and then Bob Hooper. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Beth, um, for testifying today. Um, quick question. Um, I, I believe you said that there was additional savings beyond, beyond the governor's staff and the auditor and AG and the lieutenant governor's not getting pay raises. Is there other savings that you've identified? Um, I don't think that I did say that, um, that there were other, it's um, if um, there are other places that, um, that, the administration, um, like, so there are other, there's a lot of people whose salaries are set in Pay Act. So if you took into account people whose salaries are set in Pay Act and the legislator decided not to increase those salaries, that could be additional savings that really aren't impacted by um, the union contracts. Um, so that's another, that is another way to get savings other than, um, just the kind of the appointed um, salaries. Um, also, we have in the non-salary pay act, we have a line item for um, paid family leave um, that's in there. Um, that uh, we are in the process of, um, of you know, getting a um, provider for that. And that project has been suspended because of the COVID. We, um, we're aware that none of the um, providers would be able to put a bid together and would be able to meet our timeline because number one, they are really implementing their, their plan in Massachusetts. And then number two, they just didn't have the time to put any of the work together that would be needed to kind of go into this new innovative approach. So in fiscal year 21, um, we had originally planned, I think, that that would start the FML, the paid family leave would start um, kind of more towards the second half of that fiscal year, but it doesn't look like that's going to be, that's going to be needed for the fiscal year. And that would wait till fiscal year 2022. Thank you. Uh, Bob Hooper. Um, hi. I did recognize you in the store, but didn't think you might have recognized me with a yellow beard. Um, I'd like to comment that Steve Howard better get a battery for that clock. It's been the same time the last five times he's appeared here. And uh, Joe McNeil's looking much too comfortable on the front porch there. Beth, uh, is there any, uh, when How Harold mentioned the funds before, and Jim then followed up with what, state funds, we're talking about a combination of federal funds and state funds that are coming forward. Uh, there's at this point, no reduction on the basically contractual uh, component of the federal funds that will be coming. And in fact, federal funds actually come with a bonus for personnel in an administrative fee. Uh, I'm not really quite sure of the question. Um... The pay raises are um, are kind of spread across the funds that uh, fund each employee. So um, if their job is funded, mostly federally funded, then the amount of their pay raise would be mostly federally funded. Um, cool. So that's how is if that was your question, is that your question? Yeah, and then there's a, a tip built into that, for lack of a better word, when yeah, do, yeah, it's not just federal. salaries, it's the, they're paying for portion of the benefits and the retirement, the whole, um, the whole salary and benefits component of each employee is charged across the funds that that employee's job is charged to. So for, uh, uh, you know, the total package of Pay Act was, um, uh, as originally, this is just fiscal year uh, 21, I'm just, this is the original, so there our estimate was a uh, $33 million, but the general fund portion of that was about $14 million. Um, okay. And, you know, I, and then if um, no exempts, just, in, just as a rough, rough estimate for no exempts or elected officials, um, the total savings um, would be uh, 2.25 million with a 1.43 million uh, general fund savings. Um, so, so that kind of, if that, does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one out of three down. Um, okay. What do you, I mean, there's a lot of discussion on 
federal basis about relief funds coming to help state and local governments. Are you anticipating any of that and giving consideration to it in any of the proposals you're making? Not, not with respect to pay act, no. Okay. Um, um, well, that leads into number three then. At the 8% reduction that was mentioned before, uh, we have a, I mean, everybody I think recognizes that the biggest expense in government is personnel costs. We have a pretty well-documented history of that being the first uh, avenue we go after. Uh, one of the lessons we learned from the UI experience in the last couple of months is people really make the difference. Um, how, how flush is our personnel um, pool at this point that we might even consider that as an option? It just seems like, one, it's a bad thing to say, you people got us out of a big mess in the last couple of months and now you're getting laid off. But uh, two, uh, people make government work. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there as a uh, caution, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because it's different. This um, particular crisis has impacted different par departments really differently. So for example, um, like the Agency of Transportation and maybe Agency of Natural Resources and typically in past um, crises like Irene, they're like really busy and they're the frontline workers. And in this case, it's been, um, you know, the Emergency Operations Center and the Department of Health in particular and the Department of Labor have been the ones that have been really highly stressed and um, had to, you know, step up more and more and also a lot of the administrative departments for example um, buildings and general services all the work they had to do and preparing and looking to set up new sites for um, COVID relief and my department just supporting all those other departments with trying to get temporary employees on and um, just um, trying to administer different kinds of leave. So we provide some paid leave for people. Um, we had to implement a new federal law as a new paid leave program. So a lot of that work and still I would say, um, you know, 90% uh, of my time and the same as the deputies and, and, and our directors, um, a lot of our work, high percentage, if not all is going directly towards um, supporting that COVID relief we've got. Um, You've heard about um, the pop-up testing sites for around the state for people who are, um, you know, they don't have symptoms, but they still want to be tested and also for healthcare workers. Well, that you wouldn't think I would have anything to do with the Department of Human Resources, but we have a really good um, system that we use to schedule our um, biometric screenings for employees. And we're using that to schedule those pop-up clinics, which also means, so in that scheduling takes a lot of time. So we're doing that as well as answering all those calls. So the calls that come in that say, I can't schedule this or cancel my thing, that's also going through the Department of Human Resources. So I think every department is really pitching in where they can to help. And um, I guess I'd be remiss, especially with this committee, um, not um, commending the efforts of our employees and also, um, talking about the support and the uh, cooperation with the uh, state employees union and the troopers association, as far as um, just working together to try to get communications out there and to try to um, make sure employees are taken care of. So um, I think we've all worked really hard to, to, um, to try to make this as, um, as less if possible, as less stressful for employees as we can. Um, I know Thank it's you. stressful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I Sarah, you're not on. My apologies, Rob LeClaire has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Beth. Um, can you tell me, have, have we had anybody laid off um, since this thing and has anybody suffered any loss of pay during this state of emergency? No. Thank you. That was quick and easy. That is that all your questions, Rob? It is, madam. I'll lower my hand. Okay, sounds good. 
Um, Beth, did you want to kick anything over to um, to either Dan or Harold, or shall we move on? No, I think they were the, just here in case you ask questions. Dan in particular has been, um, he's been working with uh, State Emergency Operations Center a lot. So he's been working hard on that. So in case any questions came up on COVID, that's really why he was on. And Harold's obviously the numbers guy. And I also have John Berard listening in in case any um, detailed questions regarding union contracts came in. But I don't think that they, um, you know, I've probably taken up enough of your time. Unless Thank you have questions you, that I answer. Well, stick around, we may have more questions. So I'd like to go now to Pat Gable and ask Pat to share with us the status of the collective bargaining agreement and um, the pay act is from the judiciary perspective. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and hello everybody on the call today. Uh, one nice thing about Zoom that I, I don't think we figured out on Teams is that you can actually see everybody who's on the call or most people and that's uh, that's helpful in this time. <laughs> um, I think um, because there are so many things about the contract status that are similar to the executive branch, I'll just point those out. Uh, just as in the executive branch, uh, we are here, uh, the judiciary is here to support the full funding of the collective bargaining agreement that's been reached between the judiciary and the VSCA. Um, I'll talk in a minute about uh, what the numbers will look like, uh, but uh, we hope and um, expect that uh, the legislature would do so. Uh, just as with the executive branch, if the legislature chose not to uh, provide the funding, then we also under our contract would go back into uh, collective bargaining. I think one area in particular of concern is because that uh, first um, lump sum payment comes at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, we are in the same position that if that was not funded in time to make that payment, uh, technically in any event, that would put us back into uh, collective bargaining with the union. And the, the judiciary bargaining um, team and the VSEA bargaining team worked very hard this year uh, and put a lot of time and energy and effort into reaching this agreement. Uh, and I think similarly with the executive branch, uh, they've also successfully worked out a number of additional side letters to cover the uh, judicial emergency period. And so both of those teams have worked very hard and I'm sure they would um, appreciate it if the contract was funded and they didn't have to go back and do that work uh, again. Um, in the, as in some parts of government, um, it's already been mentioned that payroll is always the largest part. In, in certain parts of government, the, um, such as the, something is crashing at my house. I don't know what that is, <laughs> but in certain parts of government, um, payroll is particularly high, and in the judiciary, we're predominantly payroll. Um, unlike uh, maybe some of the other branches, the number of uh, positions with the Pay Act as a part of, I mean, with statutory salaries uh, as a part, includes 62 judicial officers. And so out of our total 350 positions, 62 of those have statutory salaries under the Pay Act. Um, in the event, and now somebody's mowing the lawn at my house, but I'll try and ignore that because I assume you can't hear that. <laughs> in the event that the entire um, payroll of the judiciary um, had the same increase as the, um, as the collective bargaining agreement, the uh, total one year cost of FY21 would be $1,173,305. In the event the legislature chose not to fund the statutory salaries of uh, judicial officers or the seven exempts in the judiciary, the total one year cost of that proposal would be $872,300. $30, and so I think the difference there is about $300,000. The total um, second year costs, FY22, assuming that those were fully funded, the total cost of that would be $1,258,759. 
And so um, in comparison to the total payroll, of course, uh, it's a small amount, um, but um, of our, um, as I said, of our 350 positions, uh, approximately 70 of those um, would be not receiving raises if the uh, Pay Act is um, not being extended to uh, the people who have statutory salaries in the in the um, in government. And I think the um, Supreme Court and the judiciary are very interested in understanding uh, where the interbranch consensus uh, lies. Obviously, uh, we. Um, consider ourselves uh, in collaboration with the other branches during this difficult period. And if the legislature chose not to fund, not to increase the payroll of the statutory salary and not to increase uh, payroll for exempts, then we would be uh, willing to participate in that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, any questions from committee members for Pat Gable. All right, I don't see anybody diving on to the screen to tap their hand button. Great, uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Pat, it would be good to get from you at some point um, just what the details of the collective bargaining agreement are. We have the um, administration um, the details and are there differences between the judiciaries and the so th there will not be differences in terms of the uh, compensation side there are uh, differences in terms of the non-compensation side we do not have some of the provisions the executive branch has and we do have other provisions that the executive branch does not have and so we're happy to provide that detail to the committee in writing. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions from committee members? All right. Thank you, Pat, please stick with us. Um, next, I think I'd like to just invite Annie Noonan, if you have um, some thoughts to share with us, help us understand where you are in the in readiness for pay act. Good morning, uh, committee members. It's nice to see all of you. Thank you for bringing us in today, Madam Chair. We are glad to have uh, signed last night a tentative agreement with VSEA. Gary Hoadley, the chief negotiator for uh, the VSEA and uh, on this contract is with us as is Joe McNeil who assisted the department in the negotiations. Um, so wanna obviously um, call your attention to the fact that as the three chief negotiators on this contract, we were, I think we worked very well together and very collaboratively together. And I wanna remind the committee, this is the first contract for the VSEA um, and the state, state's attorney's uh, office's bargaining unit. So in essence, remember that as a new contract, this is basically building all of the costs from the ground up. So year one of the contract will obviously have more expense because it's not as though we're just adding to an existing benefit for which we budgeted. Everything here is new. Um, so um, uh, keep that in mind and, and we are working uh, fast and furiously to put together our numbers. Also want to point out that Steve Howard, the executive director of the SEA is also on the call with us today this morning. So um, because we have just last night signed the tentative agreement, the details of the provisions of the contract are not publicly available. Um, so we can say to you today that we think we've reached a uh, fair agreement. We are very confident that the ratification um, uh, through the membership will um, will be successful. Our, I can tell you that the state's attorney's executive committee, which is in essence review, had reviewed this and reviewed the sort of where we were at progress wise and then did review the tentative, voted um, to support this, unanimously voted to support the agreement. Um, I believe that um, we have uh, costed this out for year one and we will cost out for year two, we're close. Um, and I think that uh, it probably would be fair to say to you that in terms of the pay adjustment um, that we will, we are 
lining up with the executive commit uh, executive branch um, for that purpose. Uh, there are other provisions that are salary driven benefits which go into the pay act. The pay act is what is whatever is uh, driven by the salary costs. So th those pr specific provisions we're not really at liberty to speak about today um, because it would reveal actually what the terms of the agreement are. Um, and I will let Gary talk about the ratification process, but, um, but we do have a, we can provide the committee with a spreadsheet for just sort of with a general cost estimate for, for year one and probably for year two later on this afternoon. Um, I would want to also point out, Madam Chair, that the state's attorneys, the 14 state's attorneys and the 14 sheriffs are, are taking the wage freeze. Um, I think Beth uh, may have said that, but they are um, planning on being subject to the wage freeze, as is the executive director of our department, myself as an exempt, fully exempt employee. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but I could yell downstairs and have him weigh in, but I think the Secretary of State uh, also has, um, if he hasn't had a chance to talk to Beth, I know the Secretary of State is also planning on taking the wage freeze and as will his exempt employees. So that you can add that to your, to your tally sheet, Beth, if that helps you out at all. Um, if you need confirmation, I can whistle and see if he'll come upstairs, but I make him go downstairs because we cannot work on the same floor because he's too loud. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I, I'd like to see if Gary, if, if Gary can, wants to weigh in sort of in terms of the process, and then I think we can both, uh, and Joe can take questions um, from the committee. Thank you. Gary, what can you tell us about the ratification timeline? So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to your committee. Um, the membership is just being uh, notified that the bargaining team has reached the tentative agreement uh, with the department and that notice is going out today. Um, I need to speak with the rest of our staff to prepare um, the documents that need to accompany the ratification ballot. I, uh, ex the anticipated timeline that would likely be uh, in the next week that we would prepare the ballot and submit that to the membership. Uh, Steve Howard may have a better recollection of what the timeline is um, necessary for members to return those ballots, but um, we will be doing electronic balloting, so it should be uh, fairly soon, but um, it needs to be done prior to July 1st, obviously, to be able to um, complete the uh, process of having a negotiated agreement. And I'll just say now that um, the negotiation between BSEA, those, uh, the new bargaining unit uh, and the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs was uh, one of the best negotiations that I've done, I think in my 26 years at BSEA. It was very cordial. It was uh, positive. It was, um, developing uh, answers and solutions to issues that existed. And the members, the members of this new unit, I think are very pleased that they now will have the same opportunities in a lot of areas that other state employees have. So the relationship during negotiations was certainly very positive, And I expect that to extend throughout this two year contract. Thanks, Gary. Committee, any questions for Gary on the bargaining process or ratification timeline. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. I, this may not be for Gary, but he may know the answer. Uh, if not, Annie would know the answer. Um, assuming it's ratified in short order, um, did we get a cost estimate for each year of the contract? I can, Gary, let me take that. Yes, yeah, yes, Jim. Um, we do. I, uh, because we, I was preparing it last night and this morning. I think I just want to run my numbers one more time. I think I can provide by later this afternoon um, the cost estimate for both year one and year two. Um, and again, I just want to point out that some of what you will see will be salary driven benefits that are brand new. So um, I don't want to. I don't want to say that as though I'm scaring any of you that this is going to have a, a huge price tag. But of course, as a brand new contract, there are new benefits um, 
that will be incorporated uh, here that um, once, once we have this contract in place, Jim, then we are able to, for FY22, to budget for some of these expenses where right now for the FY21 budget that we've submitted, we were unable to budget them because we didn't have a contract, we didn't know the terms of the agreement. So I think that as, you, as we go forward and we're able to put some of these in, um, you'll, you, our, our provisions of this contract governing about 107 bargaining unit employees will not, will not look tremendously large. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, and I know uh, I'm sensitive to your not wanting to go public with the details of the contract until it's ratified. Um, but does it, can you tell us if it contains a similar provision as with the uh, state at large with a um, kind of a one-time um, uh, increase base amount um, to everybody uh, and then the step increases? Is it the, kind of the same format or can you not tell us at this point? Um, I, I would say that we can, we can say yes to that. Gary, you okay. agree that we can say yes to that? Yes. Um, um, yeah, many, many of the provisions will um, be, will mirror the executive branch contracts. And also I should have said representative, the effective date of this new contract will be July 1st. So the two year agreement will have the same timeline or, or effective dates as the executive branch contracts. Okay, thank, thank you both. Thank you. Committee, any other questions? Okay, well this is, uh, this is only round one and uh, due to our technical challenges, uh, we got a bit of a late start. So I appreciate everybody's patience as we made sure um, that we could stream this meeting live in order to keep our open door policy on committee um, deliberations. So we will come back to, um, to the issues around the Pay Act um, uh, at our next meeting. We need to hear from uh, VSEA um, and we also would love to hear, to, to have Annie come back and maybe share with us the spreadsheet that, that you said you may have finished by this afternoon. Um, and so stay tuned because Andrea will be in touch with you to, uh, to schedule further conversations about Pay Act. Um, I want to again say thank you to committee members for your flexibility and patience today and, and a big thanks to, uh, to our IT folks who've been scrambling to make sure we can continue to conduct our business despite a few snags with the technology this morning. So. Um, that is a wrap for today, and I think we can go ahead and adjourn this meeting, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.